The issue is under debate, reductionism and holism. Now, this is not really a versus debate, although people do think of it that way. You need to be very clear on something here. The whole of science is reductionist. Therefore, we're not saying that reductionism is ever a bad thing or we're not going to be scientists. So everything is reductionist in science, but sometimes we don't take a holistic view and this can be limiting. So that's the most important thing to keep in mind. It's not a, is reductionism better than holism? Which one should we choose? We have to be reductionist in order to do psychology. We have to be reductionist in order to be scientists. So let's get going. Okay, so holism and reductionism. First of all, you need to learn the key terms. Holism means people and behaviour that should actually be studied as a whole system. That's the theory behind holism. We cannot study people and their behaviour separately. It's a whole system. Okay, so we can't isolate a behaviour and say that this actual behaviour needs to be treated. Rather, we need to look at the people and their lives and the behaviour. Reductionism means that we always take any behaviour and we need to break it down into its constituent parts. The simplest way to look at this would be to think of the wood and trees. Okay, so holism or holism means that we are actually seeing the whole wood with all the trees, but we're not focusing on any one tree. And obviously, reductionism means that we are just focusing on that one tree and trying to sort out that, you know, that instance of behaviour or whatever else it is. It might be a mental illness. And a really good way to think of it is when you look at mental illnesses, it's really obvious there. If we decide that you are depressed and you are depressed because of your serotonin levels, well, that would be reductionism. OK, because we have reduced everything about your mental health disorder down to one thing, levels of serotonin. However, holism would say that's not enough. Yes, there may be low serotonin levels, but we, you know, we need to look at your whole lifestyle, at your work, at your relationships, at your food intake, at your exercise, everything about you. OK, and then we can decide how we're going to treat you. All right, so now let's move on to AO1 points. Now here, the first thing is that we have levels of explanation. There, there is always reductionism at the absolute key level of neurochemical, but actually reductionism actually goes down in a sort of reductionist hierarchy. And a really good example will be OCD. As you go down the list, it becomes more reductionist. So, socio-cultural level. This involves all the people's behaviour that you would consider odd. You know, so, you know, let's say washing your hands all the time would be very odd because we don't do that a lot. Or switching off the lights many times. Most people don't do that, so that's a socio-cultural level. But then you can reduce down to a psychological level. And this would be the actual person's experience of having obsessive thoughts. Then you could move down to a physical level. And this would be the actual sequence of the way that you wash your hands, because there's always a sequence. And then the actual biological level would be hypersensitivity of the basal ganglia because that is the area of the brain that may be involved in these sort of OCD behaviours. And finally, at the smallest micro level, we would reduce it to neurochemical. There is not enough serotonin. Next thing we need to define biological reductionism. We are biological organisms. All behaviour is at some level biological and can be explained by our 
brain structure, our body biochemistry and by our genes. And this assumption has been applied to successfully explain and to treat many mental illnesses. Thirdly, environmental reductionism. All behaviourists observe behaviour and they break down complex learning into simple stimulus and response mechanisms. Now, this approach is not concerned with the cognitive approach, which is a psychological level. Here, and this is environmental reductionism, we are concerned with what we can actually observe. So we are not concerned about the mind itself because I can't observe your mind. I can observe what you're doing now. We know whatever you're doing while you're watching or listening to this video. But I can't observe what you are thinking. So in this way, in this particular sort of model of environmental reductionism, the mind itself is seen as a black box. It's completely irrelevant to our learning. Now let's do some evaluations. You need to go back to this. Okay, here's the first evaluation point. Holism. A plus here is that it can explain many aspects of social behaviour that could not be explained by looking at the individual. A very good example in Zimbardo's study would be de-individuation. And this explains why the prisoners and the guards, not always the prisoners so much as the guards, did such awful behaviours because they weren't really thinking of themselves as being responsible. Minus point is that actually holism can be impractical. Why is this? Because, e.g., there are so many factors involved in any mental illness like OCD, schizophrenia, depression, phobias, that we cannot deal with them all. So if somebody has OCD and we can say, well, there's a problem with their serotonin levels, that's very easy to deal with far easier than dealing with their home life and their work life and their relationships and their diet and their exercise routine, okay? So by just focusing on one thing, e.g. serotonin levels, we can just deal with it. Reductionism plus and minuses. Reductionism plus, it has huge scientific credibility. It has got scientific testable methods such as experiments and observations to record behaviour changes. Thus, it really elevates psychology to, to exactly the same level as other sciences. Okay, now this is really important because there's a big argument about psychology being the science. And if psychology does not use, does not emphasize reductionism, it no longer becomes a science. Minus of reductionism. Obviously, it can really oversimplify phenomena and thus can lose the overall context. As I say, we can see the tree, but not the wood. E.g. biological things about us, like, um, there's an example here um, that, that leads us to point a finger, okay, so I can be pointing my finger at you, are always the same. But why I start to point my finger at you or somebody else, well, that's always going to be different. So if I'm just going to focus on the biological mechanisms in my body and say, the reason I'm pointing my finger at you is all to do with my autotomic nervous system and is all to do with my blood sugar levels and muscle activity, etc., to point the finger at you, well, that's losing the, why am I pointing the finger at you? Because you've done something and it completely loses that. So therefore, reductionism loses the whole context or the bigger picture. However, finally, 
there is always the interactivist approach, a very good AM3 point here, which would argue that we need to combine holism and reductionism and therefore we will overcome these limitations above. A very good example would be schizophrenia and if you study that you will know what that is. So in schizophrenia, yes we often need to use drugs, we need to use antipsychotic drugs to control this disorder but at the same time we would never fail to look at the person's lifestyle, particularly their family relationships, dysfunctional family, etc, etc. Yeah, I think that's it. So I do hope that was a very short but useful video for you all and good luck. And don't forget that I've actually posted this below the video and all you need to do is to cut and paste it. Okay, good luck everyone.